Hey folks, welcome back to the Manana No Mas podcast. Uh, with us today, we've got someone that I'm super, super pleased to have uh, on camera and on audio with us. And that is the author of Seeing the Big Picture. And uh, Kevin, I met you in Arizona. So I'm pleased to see you again on video. Uh, Kevin Cope. Kevin, yeah. why don't you go ahead and give us a little something about you? Yeah, Kurt, um, good to see you again as well. Uh, so my organization, uh, Acumen Learning, uh, is uh, what we're in our 18th year now of business and wow. probably trained, uh, what are we, about a half a million people around the world, uh, 40 different countries around this idea of the, the book title, Seeing the Big Picture. But in essence, what we do is help people understand how their company makes money and then how to make better decisions in that money making process. Great, great. I didn't realize you had trained half a million people. That's a, that's a fair amount of folks. Yeah, um, we've reached them uh, through book. We've got digital content. We do live in-person sessions, uh, live virtual sessions as well. And so yeah. we've got a lot of avenues and, and ways to, to reach organizations. Nice, nice. Now, you had given me a copy of the book. Uh, I can't believe it's been that long already, but it was like last November or something like that, last September. Yeah. And uh, read the book, shared it with some coworkers when I worked at an office, and I was I'm blown away. I mean, the book's small enough to, to read, right? It's, it's not, it's not daunting. It's not war and peace, but man, it goes into the five <laughs> drivers of business. And then next thing you know, you, you know, if, if you're a business minded person, you just find yourself staring at the pages going one after the other, after the other. So, uh, well done. Uh, what, what caused you to kind of break things into like the five drivers or what, what attracted you to this kind of content? Yeah. Well, um, you know, when I started this in, in 2002, uh, my sense was that people in business, sort of at the mid and higher levels, really understood how their companies make money. You know, I, I assumed they were probably fairly business savvy. And what I quickly learned, and it's validated consistently, is that, um, you know, you can go fairly high, even in well-known companies. And while people are functionally brilliant, I mean, they really get IT, they get HR, um, they get operations, they get the function they work in. Yeah. What, what they really lack is that big picture sense of how the company makes money. And yeah. so, um, it, and this really becomes evident when they um, are trying to make strategy decisions or businesses uh, or business decisions that impact the P&L. Uh, if, if they can go back to their functional expertise, they're great. But if they venture into, oh, I need to decide whether I had to buy this, uh, you know, this new uh, copy machine, what's the break even on that, for example, or if I'm going to invest in this new building, or this new assembly line, that's where they sort of get beyond their expertise. And so uh, we really started this organization to really bridge that gap, to help people really get much more clear on um, how to understand their organization from a business and financial perspective. And so the five drivers really kind of emanated out of that process. Um, nice. And I can describe those if you want, Kurt, if that'd be helpful. Well, you could. I, I was just, as you were talking, you know, my mind was spinning, right? I'm thinking of how many people I shared a conference room with when a decision was going to come up. And then someone at the top of the food chain goes, I think we should X, Y, Z, right? And you're in the room going, why in the world would he say that? Like, what? Well, and you're trying to think of like, okay, is there a bigger picture I don't know about? Did yeah. they not understand what they're doing? Did, you know, did they not consider, you know, that we have to capitalize this or, you know, defund this other project? And so I, I can see exactly what you're talking about. It doesn't seem to matter how high up the ladder you go. There's always some kind of gap or deficiency that needs to be filled. Yeah. You, it, and it's really evident um, when you go, for example, to an all hands meeting and maybe a company has just announced their quarterly results or their annual results. And they're talking about things like gross profit margin, net profit margin, earnings per share, uh, operating leverage. Um, and uh, the deal they're going to do is going to be accretive earnings. And, the average employee is just not connecting. I mean, there might be a few that are tracking, but most employees are just not really connected to uh, most of what a CEO and CFO says about the business and financial results of the organization. So the gap's pretty big. When, when you talk in these terms, and, and I'd like to get into the five drivers. I'm not putting you off there. But, yeah. so, but, but the, the audience, like when you say an all-hands meeting, like, so if I'm in a room and there's, let's say it's a 250 person office space, right? Yeah. In that space, there's 25 or 30 people, maybe 50 people kind of at the top of the chain, the guys with the nicer desks, right? Um, those guys might have an idea of the bigger picture in some cases, 
but a lot of the people at the lower end don't. How important do you think it is that, you know, most employees inside a corporation have an idea of, of other departments or other factors regarding what they do? Well, it's a great question. And I would suggest there's at least two reasons why it's important. <laughs> One is that um, a company doesn't change strategy or doesn't become more effective because simply, um, you know, the CEO and the CFO at the top said, say, we need to do this. It happens because you have thousands of employees making the right decisions in the role every day. And so that alignment, uh, you know, that corporate alignment or that um, alignment around strategy and direction is really important for organizations. Um, and, and so that's the first reason. The second reason, you know, is that individuals want to know how they fit in, how they matter, and how they make a difference. I, I love the idea that people work hard for a paycheck, they'll work harder for a person, and they'll work hardest for a purpose. Yep. Um, yeah. And especially, you know, again, millennials are really hungry to know, so what am I going to be doing? How's that going to add value? How am I going to fit into the organization? How will I help move business results forward? And if you can't connect the dots and help your employees really see that big picture perspective, then you lose their engagement. Um, yeah. You lose their real, um, you know, energy. Uh, you might get their, um, you know, their back during the hours of operation, but they're, you're not going to capture their mind, you know, their heart, their spirit in the work. So that's the second reason why I think it's important for people to really see the big picture of how a company makes money. Yeah. And then if I threw in a third one here, it would be um, leaders need to be more effective at communicating that strategy and direction. If they don't know what it is themselves, it's not uh, you know, easy for them to bridge the gap for their employees. So. Yeah. My personal, you know, uh, personal development education, education, that education path was in leadership mm -hmm. you know, with the John Maxwell stuff and Ken Blanchard and some of those fellows. Great stuff. And when you're, when you're studying in those lines, there's a lot of similarities and parallels to what you had just mentioned, right? Like if I don't cast, if I'm a leader and I don't cast the vision or, or, or get people's buy-in or their commitment along the way, you know, it's next to impossible to move to the next level, right? You set different milestones for growth, right? And then you sit there and you wonder, well, why aren't I getting this? But what you just described is, you know, it's not enough to just cast a vision. Maybe we need to give them more of the details of the five drivers or something like that to, to get their commitment and their buy-in. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it, it, you just get a whole different outcome when it's like, I need you to do this and yeah. now do this versus, you know, here's where we're headed. Um, here are the steps to get here and to get to that where we're headed. And here's how you can help in that process. And, and people are much more engaged when, they, when they've got that sense of how they fit in. Oh, great. Well, I mean, you offered and we've got the time. So if you'd give me a, a description of some of the drivers, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, um, I actually have the five drivers on the board behind me, but that's <laughs> probably a little hard to see. But picture a diamond shape. And in this diamond shape, if you look at the very top point of a diamond, that's cash. And then if you go to the right point, that's profit. Bottom point is assets. Left point is growth. And right in the middle of the model is people. Now, uh, here's how I know that this five driver model fits every organization. It's not just sort of a theoretical, let's grab something out of the air, but I know this model fits because there are three financial statements that all publicly traded companies have to submit to the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission every quarter and at year end. And even if you aren't publicly traded, you're using these three financial statements um, to do your taxes, or to manage your company. And those three statements are the statement of cash flows, the profit loss, and the balance sheet. And that's the first three drivers. Statement of cash flows is cash, that very top uh, business driver. Profit loss, of course, is the right uh, you know, uh, circle or point. The bottom one is assets, and a balance sheet talks about assets, liabilities, and net assets. So that's why I know those three business drivers fit. Now, growth is there because that's what builds value to business. It's what attracts great people. Um, and it keeps you innovative. And at the very center of the model is people, that's employees meeting the needs of customers. And that, that relationship drives cash, profit, assets, uh, and growth on the outside. So uh, that's why I'm really confident <laughs> that the, you know, your, your CEO uh, may not hold up the five driver model and say, hey, this is what, how we're tracking. But in reality, the three financial statements are how they manage the business. Growth is needed to build value, to attract good people, and of course, people in the middle drive it. So it's, it's very intuitive once you get to know the, the five drivers. Yeah. So 
let's say someone gets involved and they, and they want to get a hold of you, right? There, there's contact information on the back of the book, right? And, I, and I'm going to share the number and the, and the website in the description of the podcast. So, so we're covered there. But when someone gets involved with Acumen Learning and they want to go over their type of training, how, how does that kind of roll forward? What could someone expect when they get in touch with you guys? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so <clears throat> our approach is to be very customized. Uh, there's sort of three things that we do we believe are really important. But it's got to be very customized. And so rather than come in and talk generically about a profit loss, let's talk about your profit loss. So we spend time getting to know your business, um, getting to know your strategy and key uh, performance measures. And so as we're talking about these five business drivers, it's all about how your company's doing around it, how you're performing around those. And so uh, as we get started, we go through a customization process where um, we can really bring kind of life and detail um, to uh, this business model. Um, and so that, that's where we do get started is to kind of set it up. Usually the, the interview process is how we can do a lot of customization. If you're a publicly traded company, we do a lot of research online. Uh, and we also uh, look at your benchmark or competitor companies, suppliers, customers, et cetera. So we can bring kind of that whole picture of how, how your company makes money. Yeah, that's, that's involved. I, I'm going to ask a question, kind of maybe a risky one, but when you start to work with a new company, um, and, and I'll, I'll lay this out. I'll, I'll be transparent and say that this is why I'm asking. Yeah. Um, I train power sports dealers and marine dealers how to improve their service business. And typically, I talk to the dealer owner, and the owner has an impression that, that things are operating at a higher level than they really are. And then, they, so they want to have a discussion or training at some, you know, higher mental level. They, they, they assume that like everyone's a college graduate and they got a, a doctorate and whatever, right? And then I show up and I do a needs assessment, kind of what you're talking about, right? Where you're evaluating things. And when I do the needs assessment, I figure things out like these guys don't know how to answer the phone properly. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the basics of communication. They don't. So then I end up saying, okay, we have to train your people starting here. We're, we're not even to this yet. And so, so we have to work up. Um, is it difficult when you run it, when you go to do a needs assessment or an evaluation with a company for a custom application and you realize that they're not where they thought they were and you have to kind of build them up? Yeah, good question. So my, my sense is, uh, and our experience is, that as we talk with organizations, they often um, sort of, especially at the executive level, overestimate what the rank and file really know. Yeah. So as we talk about, you know, we'd love to come in and um, we'd love to kind of explain to them and, and show them how the financial statements work. We want to help them understand how they can improve the business results and the financials. You know, some executives will say, well, you know, doesn't everybody sort of know that? It's really intuitive. Yeah. And then we start asking them, well, so when you see people make decisions, do, they, do you sense they make decisions with a real understanding of the business in mind? And when you hear them describe options and, and uh, how they're going to uh, make a decision between two different approaches, do you see them sort of exhibit an understanding? And that's where the light bulb goes off for the executives. They say, oh, yeah, even though it seems to me like everybody understands a P&L or a balance sheet, when I actually see them talk about it or have to make decisions, I can see where the gaps do exist. And so, in part, it's, it's sort of creating that awareness if you yeah. will, around the need for the rank and file to really understand these ideas. So, and then, and so I'm going to go out on another ledge. <laughs> yeah. When, when you, when you bring to light the rank and file, you know, lack of training, but then you see that through your training, you can enhance that. Well, then it seems like the return is, is a higher fold than what the executive originally expected. Right. Because it yeah, elevates really, things completely. Yeah, it really can be. And, and it's interesting. <laughs> the, different ways in which this will manifest itself. For example, we were working with a big med device company. This is a company that's probably over 20 billion in sales. And we were actually training their sales folks when they call on customers, how do you have a good discussion um, using the language of business? So instead of just coming in and saying, you know, here's what our device does and here's why you need it. If you can go in and, and as a business partner say, look, here's what I know you're trying to accomplish in your business. And here's how our product can help support that. Uh, we found that um, these salespeople were getting their first sale much faster when they went through our business acumen training. And so um, it's really fun to see how people take the application of understanding 
um, their business or their customer's business and use that to get much better results, um, to have much better conversations and much better connections. And so not only um, can it help individuals in their own role, their own organization, it also helps them as they interact with uh, other business partners, suppliers, vendors, customers, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find the whole thing, you know, actually kind of fi- uh, fascinating. If, if I were to take a look at like employee turnover, for example, you know, in my mind, I'm already thinking to myself, if I'm working for a company and I keep going back to the 250 people in an office, I don't know why, but I'm comfortable with that number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if I got that many people in an office and I invest in them and I, and I train them and we have a certain amount of transparency about numbers and how they work and cash flow and what the company goals are. I think, I mean, I'm just trying to put my, myself in those shoes. I think I would be less inclined to want to leave that company. I'm thinking I would feel like a more of, more of a part of the team, you know, yeah. more yeah. embedded. Yeah, no question. You're, you're on the right track and, and you know, hitting it to the real bullseye in this. But when people have a sense again of how they fit in, yeah. And what they're working towards, the engagement level just goes up. Um, there's one measure that talks about, um, this was the conference executive board did a, a survey. As I recall, there were tens of thousands of people across many industries around the world. And they were really trying to get at um, what drives engagement. And one of the top levers for engagement was people really be cl- being clear on how their work impacts company results. Yeah. Um, and what they found is when people feel that engagement, they give much more discretionary effort, meaning um, they're not just working to, you know, fill the eight hours. They're also willing to work beyond, you know, just what's asked or what's necessary because they're more involved, interested, engaged in the work that they're doing. They really have sort of a context for it and, um, you know, feel much more a part of it. And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think understanding this is not only good for the company, it's also good for the individual. Yeah. Um, yeah. The subtitle of the book, matter of fact, says um, that you read the, the See the Big Picture book. The subtitle is Business Acumen to Build Your Credibility, Career, and Company. Yeah. And so as individuals um, start making better decisions, it builds their credibility, certainly helps the company. And if a, a person is more credible in helping their company, it's really going to be good for their own career. Nice. Nice. So I kind of skipped ahead in my questioning, I think I got excited about talking about the content instead of yeah. talking about you. What made you decide to write the book? I mean, what made you decide, you know, I'm going to put this on paper and, and make this happen? Well, you know, actually the business came before the book. Um, started the business in 2002. And it wasn't until 2012 that, that uh, the book was released. And uh, we were really fortunate to have it become a New York Times bestseller. And, uh, number one on the Wall Street Journal, Barnes & Noble, USA Today, and uh, one other. And so I, we, were, we were really uh, fortunate and blessed to have um, the book do well. And so, uh, but it was the business that came first. Yeah. So we're out teaching people um, about uh, how to make better decisions, the five driver business model. We were teaching them how to read financials and really found that um, a way to reinforce that learning. Um, would be really helpful and useful to participants. And so um, the book kind of came after. And I must admit, uh, I sort of fantasized about the writing process. I thought, oh, I'm going to go sit up in the cabin and I'll sit down and I'll look out at the, you know, the forest and the mountains. Yep. And it'll inspire me to write. And I thought, boy, that's not me. <laughs> really quickly. And so I, I've had uh, some really good partners who would follow me around as I delivered content and as my team delivered content and basically captured uh, what we were teaching in the program. And, and then I did a lot of editing. That part I yeah. really enjoyed. Um, I loved inserting the stories and the real business examples and, and shaping the book. But I, I just needed somebody to get sort of the basics down. Yeah. And uh, so that, that process kind of culminated in, in 2012. Well, it sounds like your writing experience was a lot smarter than my writing experience. <laughs> I, uh, I stayed up working nights on my first book and wrote 80% of it before my wife even realized what I was doing. I, really? <laughs> finally, she said, she said, look, honey, I don't, what, what are you doing on the internet in the yeah. middle of the night? Yeah. You know, like I finally got out and I was, I was like, no, no, I'm not doing what you might think I'm doing. I'm writing a book. Yeah. And, then, uh, and she was like, what do you mean you're writing a book? You know? And I told her, you know, I've got stuff in my head that won't, yeah, I got to get it out. And I don't know if I'm ever going to sell it or not. I don't, I really don't care. I just, it's an exercise. I got to get it done. 
Yeah. And I didn't think anyone was going to buy the thing. And I ended up getting a job at Ducati North America and then Suzuki and all of that based off of writing a book about, you know, the service industry for uh, power sports and automotive. Yeah. Well, congratulations. And it sounds like you've got more of a natural talent and passion and inclination to write. Um, I'm much more of a verbal communicator and writing for me feels, um, you know, I can articulate it, but getting it down into words somehow that doesn't translate as well as it did for you. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say it translated as, as good. I, I remember the panic when I realized that so many people had bought it. Like, and I'd say so many, I mean, I'm not a bestseller, right? But in my industry, a lot of people were starting to read the book and then I started to go through it myself and I was like, wow, I really got to touch this up. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, so, again, I was fortunate to have a team and, yeah. and we'd worked with a, uh, you know, a, a company that helped with the editing and uh, positioning and graphics and everything. So I, it really was not a solo effort by any stretch. I, I owe a lot of credit to, um, you know, publishers and, uh, yeah. um, you know, uh, individuals that they really were part of the process. Well, that's fantastic. Um, one more question for you. And, and again, this is one of those ones where, um, you might not even have an answer for this. I'm going to say when you are, if you're looking for your best client, if you're looking for the, 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 the bestest opportunity that would ever come to Acumen Learning, what, what's that customer look like? Or who, who's the target that you guys look to do business with? Yeah. So uh, we've probably worked with about every, we've worked with 30 of the Fortune 50. So some really um, uh, great organizations, uh, great names, very, you know, uh, household names. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and so those are, those are always fun, but we've worked with everybody in between and probably every function and role you can imagine, you know, anywhere from a, an hourly worker up to a CEO of a, you know, a multi-billion dollar company. And, and again, everything in, in between on that, but probably, um, where, um, most of our, uh, you know, our clients are looking is probably sort of that mid, um, level manager, senior level manager or leader. And they've just gotten promoted. And so they've been a doer. And now they're leading a team or a department. And all of a sudden, it's boy, when it was the technical decisions, I had it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I knew what I was doing. Now that I sort of need to make decisions that impact the budget um, and uh, I have to manage a PL, and uh, boy, that's where they, they really um, start looking around and looking for help. And it's not always easy to raise your hand in a company and say, you know, I'm not sure how to read a PL. So most people fly under the radar. Yeah. Um, and worried about, you know, getting discovered. But that, that's a, a really odd, real good audience that we enjoy working with, those folks that are now going from doer to leader and, and managing an organization. We also find that we do a lot with sales organizations, uh, salespeople that want to not just sell, but they want to be a business partner. Know. So we help them really um, understand their client, how to read their client's financials, understand their client's strategy, and then as they come in, really come in as a partner helping them solve those, uh, you know, business challenges their clients are facing. Nice. Anyway, those are, those are at least two areas that, uh, you know, come to mind as the clients that are sort of in that sweet spot. What would be, let's, let's pretend someone's listening to this podcast right now. Yeah. And they never heard of Acumen Learning. They never heard of training their staff. They've been, you know, bootstrapping this thing for a decade, right? Yeah. Um, what is, what's a yellow flag for them? Like, as they're listening to this podcast, what's something that, would pop off of a spreadsheet or, or something to them. They'd go, holy crap, I really could use this kind of training mm. and then call you. <laughs> yeah. Um, another great question, Kurt. I would suggest there's probably three or four things that you might be observing or hearing in your environment. You think, boy, we could, this might be a fit. Some of these I've already mentioned, but uh, you yeah. know, just to summarize, one is they see decisions being made that don't seem to have good business sense to them. Um, and so they, and it might be individuals that were making decisions that worked for their silo, but when you step back and looked at the business impact, it just didn't make sense. So that's one, um, observing people not making good business decisions. Um, a second would be that, um, you have, um, individuals, uh, being promoted up into a role for a first time. And so it, it, it might be a high potential group that you're looking at within your organization. And these are folks that you uh, felt like have been really good technical people for, for a number of years. And you're just worried that that next step just could be their undoing. Um, yeah. And so that would be a, sort of another opportunity or red flag. Um, a third would be that um, as you listen to earnings call um, transcripts or press releases or your people are in all hands meetings, 
And if you have a sense that they're not really tracking with what the executives of the company are communicating, they're not really um, on board with um, what, uh, what uh, the company is trying to accomplish from either a strategy or a financial metric perspective. And so that would be another opportunity to recognize that there's a big gap there. And then, you know, last one would be you're in a strategy meeting and you um, are trying to brainstorm around what do we need to do to solve this situation? And you aren't getting a lot of input from individuals. Yeah. Um, they're just sort of standing back and saying, man, I, you know, I just don't want to contribute to a discussion where it involves strategy and, and the financials. And so that would be another indicator that maybe you've got a gap in your organization uh, between what people should know and their ability to contribute. That's good stuff. That's really good stuff. You know, it, it's, uh, for, for me, like there's certain things that happen at a motorcycle dealership where I can just go that, that person needs me. Right. It, it's, yeah. uh, you know, you get to the, you go to visit the dealer and the, the lots full of motorcycles to work on, but mechanics leave at three o'clock in the afternoon. They go, Oh, we're out of work. Yeah. Well, you can't be out of work. <laughs> there's a whole lot full of motorcycles yeah. to work on. Yeah. yeah. So then you have to figure out internally what's going on inside that company where they don't have parts on time. They don't have approvals on time, you know, and the guys get fed up and go home early. Well, that's a bad environment. That's a huge, that's not a yellow flag. That's a red flag, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's just, those are the types of things I'm like, you know, if someone's listening to the podcast and they, they, they might even think it's business as usual. That's the scary part is a lot of people don't recognize a yellow flag or a red flag. They, cause they've been in it for so long. They think it's normal. Uh, it's a great point. And, and by the way, here's um, one additional uh, kind of uh, tip I'll give you. Um, consider going around and asking your employees five or six or seven things about your business. For example, ask them this. Um, so do you have a sense of how much cash we had on hand as an organization? This would probably be for a larger publicly traded company, but um, e even if it's a company that shares their financials and they're small. So do you have a sense of how much cash we have on hand? Um, do you know what our cash from operations was last quarter or last year? Um, do you know what our, our net profit margin is as an organization? And by the way, do you have a sense of how we might stack with, up with other companies in our industry? Do you know what our revenue was last year? And do you know how much it grew from the previous year? How about our net income? Do you know what our net income was last year mm -hmm. and how it grew from the previous year? And so those are measures that executives live and die by. Um, yeah. That's how they manage their business. Um, if you have investors or shareholders, that's what shareholders want to know about every quarter and every year. And so those types of questions, your employees ought to have a sense about. And even if they can't rattle off the number, they ought to know at least, so why is it important? How do you measure it? And what am I doing in my role to impact that? So that little pop quiz, if you will, yeah. around measures like that, um, I, just be curious and go ask a few uh, colleagues around the office, hey, do you have a sense of this for our organization? And you might be surprised at how big that gap is. Cool. Now, uh, I want to honor your time. So I've only got one more question for you. And then if, if you think I'm cool and you want to hang out, that's fine. <laughs> but, but I want to honor your time. Um, we're doing this interview right now. I'm going to say in the middle of the COVID crisis, because I really don't know how long the COVID crisis is going to last. I don't know if anybody really does. Um, do you have any opinions or perceptions on either the, the, the opportunities, right? Because they say disruption equals opportunity, right? Do you see opportunities with training people now? Or, or do you think um, a lot of people are, are going to try and buy time? Like they're just going to try and pause things and wait for the COVID crisis to be over. What, what do you think is the, 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 the right energy right now? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm reading a book, <laughs> another book <laughs> that uh, obstacles. It's by Ryan. Let me see if I can find it here quickly. The obstacle is the way. The obstacle um, is the, the time, way. The, the timeless sort of turning trials into triumphs. It's a great read. Um, and I'm seeing opportunities yeah, in this industry right now um, in the training side and in the training world. Um, it's amazing how few people, and Kurt, we were talking about this before, and you were ahead of the curve as well. You know, you, you went virtual before virtual was cool. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't say before it was cool, but you were ahead of the curve. Uh, before it was that. a necessity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and fortunately, um, our company uh, it was as well. Now, we were also have done life training, and that has completely stopped. But I'll tell you, the number of companies who want to continue developing their people, especially while they're at home and have time, yeah. Um, it, 
the, the, it, it's a growing um, you know need right now, and I'm surprised at how few companies were able to address that. Yeah. And so we're finding that we're going deeper with a few of our clients than we were before, because well, now that they've got time, and most of our other um, you know suppliers or training partners aren't able to do it, so they're turning to us uh, for that. And so, boy, um, look at this. And I'm doing this with my leadership team right now. Matter of fact, uh, it's going to culminate in conversation tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. And the conversation is, look, we're in a crisis. We're seeing obstacles. What are the opportunities that could exist? So uh, we spent the last month making sure we you know, take care of the basic needs of the organization. But now we're stepping back and saying, so what are the real opportunities? And they're out there. Yeah. Uh, I'm really convinced and we're seeing that um, with clients that want to develop people that no other way to do it virtually, and, and we're able to step in and do that. And I'm sure there's a number of other uh, ways to, to do that, no matter what your business is, no matter what your role is within an organization. Step back and say, look, there's a silver lining here somewhere. There's an opportunity. Um, you know, what might that be? For example, in, in this book, Thomas Jefferson, um, you know, uh, was not a great orator. <laughs> he just wasn't, he just didn't have it down with the spoken word. Um, and, uh, and so he turned to writing, and he still wanted to be in politics. But because he wasn't a great orator, he really honed his writing skills and, of course, wrote the Declaration of Independence in about one draft. And so he, he, that's an example of an individual taking an obstacle and turning it into an opportunity. And, and I think they really um, maybe not abound in this crisis, but they're there. We just yeah. need to stop, be calm, be hopeful, have faith. And then look for those opportunities and take action on them. Yeah, I, in, in my industry, I, I, I took not a dare, but I, I published an article three weeks ago that said, if you concentrate on communication and connection during this crisis, your business will have the opportunity to increase, to expand. Yeah. Yeah. Because power sports dealers were ruled an essential business in most states. And they said uh, social distancing was cool, which means for the first time in decades, a grown man riding a motorcycle by himself is acceptable again. Yeah. So I'm like, we could actually have a resurgence in our industry if people would just take the opportunity to let it happen. Yeah. And so, you know, I've talked about, you know, revamping showrooms during the downtime, like redo it, have a relaunch when the thing's over, right? Clean the service center, you know, epoxy the floors, put in LED lights, you know, make it so that when business comes back, you can be more productive and now's the time where we could really focus on like customer interactions and customer policies. And, you know, yeah. you, like Kevin, do you like going to a motorcycle dealership for service? Well, it just struck me. I, I told you <laughs> uh, when we last a year ago that I bought a DR650, yeah. <laughs> you know, a, a, an Enduro. And um, yeah, I, and it just struck me. Why don't um, the power sport dealers take the showroom out into the parking lot right now? Because if people are nervous about going into a store, take it yeah. out to the parking lot. Um, space, the, space the vehicles out, you know, um, six, eight, ten feet apart so the people can actually stop, walk around, see what's going on, take a look. Yeah. Anyway, I, you know, you're bringing up a great example of an opportunity um, that exists in, you know, where others would see an obstacle. And it's – so now it's three weeks after I wrote the article – and I'm yeah. getting feedback from people through LinkedIn that are going, oh, I did what you said. And my business grew. And other people say, nah, we're, we're kind of status quo. And I'm like, but in a crisis, even if you stay status quo, that's, that's a big a win. win. That's a huge right? win. That's a yeah. win. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's really interesting just to see how things, things go. And I had a feeling that you were going to say, now's the time to work on training more than ever. But, you know, I got to get it from as many professionals as possible on, <laughs> on record as saying this is the time. People, um, people have downtime. Um, yeah, you know, and, and, and let's fill that downtime. And I'll tell you, um, Andy Grove, uh, the founder of Intel, said, um, in times of crisis, poor companies um, go out of business, good companies survive, and great companies thrive. Yep. Yeah. And so this is an opportunity to, to, you know, for companies to really set themselves apart and look for those angles or those opportunities. And, and developing your people um, in a downtime, it, it, the opportunity is just right there. And yeah. while some people might get, uh, you know, companies might get fearful and shrink, and, oh, we can't do that. The, the great ones see uh, that now is the perfect time to work on capacity and capability and develop your people. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I would make a short list of, of deficiencies without insulting people. Right. But I'd be like, Hey, you're going to take that Excel course online that we've been wanting you to take for two years. You know, you're yeah. going to go take Microsoft access. You're going to go, you yeah. know, and, and I mean, even if it's just through lynda.com and then you're footing the $50 a month bill for people, I mean, you're, you're investing in them and you're giving them the opportunity to improve. And that's what the great companies will do. Yeah. Great companies will, will always look forward, develop, enhance capability, um, especially in downtimes. Yeah. Nice, nice. Well, right underneath your face right about now will be the website that says acumenlearning.com. And so uh, you could point like this and then you'll know that people are going to be <laughs> going to your site. And then uh, other than that, man, I really just want to thank you for your time and your transparency and, and your ability to, to sit and chat with us during this time. I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, my pleasure. Kurt, my, and just, uh, you know, to return the admiration, um, I'm really impressed um, that you uh, had the foresight to be headed kind of in this virtual direction and this uh, ability to connect people virtually, um, you know, before uh, people found it as a necessity. Um, and so uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than it is good. <laughs> and I, it sounds, it feels to me like you brought both to the table. Your timing was impeccable, <laughs> but uh, you know, you're also bringing some great content, some great advice uh, in a much needed time. So yeah, I, let me just offer a thanks for your part in, in connecting people and uh, helping people see hope and opportunity and uh, sort of how to navigate uh, you know, this uh, challenging times. Thank you. Yeah, it's gonna be a learning experience for all of us. You know? I, and just to kind of bounce off of what you just said, it's okay to make mistakes. And I think that's where a lot of people actually get held up. You know, it's okay to throw something out there and go, oh, well, that didn't yeah. work, let's try something else. Yeah, you know, we're gonna come out of this uh, in many ways better for it. I, I believe so. Uh, this is my third crisis, 1987, uh, 9-11, and 2007 and 8. And after coming through every one of those, I looked back and thought, boy, had I known it would have been okay, I would have been more hopeful, more faithful, I'd have yeah. been more engaged. And so I, uh, maybe it's uh, just my age, but I'm looking at this saying, you know what, we're going to get through it and we're going to be better for it. Um, we'll be a little bumped and bruised, um, but we will be. Uh, we yeah. will get through this. And so, yeah, well, certainly I, echo that sentiment. I, I built and branded Manana no Mas during the economic crisis before I went to Ducati. Yeah. And then, uh, I never let it die. It was one of those things I thought I built it. Why kill it? And now here, here we are, you know, full circle 2020 on a relaunch. And I think we're off to a pretty good start. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you, man. Thank Great you for your time. Yeah, likewise. Thanks. Thanks. And